Let me put it this way. I, I, like, I like to think that God is real. I don't believe in God because the idea that an omniscient, loving being would judge me who is mortal and ignorant based on a few years' experience, I find to be rather a cruel thought. All the power that God has, he, she, it has given to me. So we're definitely one. I hope I hope there's there's something else out there. It'd be it'd be fun to experience either that or we're all just evolved apes. Um, I was raised atheist. I don't believe in a higher power, but I also don't claim to know everything about the world. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know if there is one. I just pretend, I guess, and hope that there's something else out there. Is there a God? Easy question, we should knock this out in 30 minutes, right? Pretty simple. Well, uh, this is a really intimidating question. I have to admit that this week planning for this, though I have a strong conviction myself that there is, to try and sum up all of the things that have been said about this question in one morning seems a little impossible, a little intimidating. Because this is one of the biggest questions any of us have ever asked about life. Any, any question that we've come up with about who we are as people, about what this world is really all about, this is the big one. Now, you may expect that someone like me who works in a church kind of answered this question really easily in my life. But for me, it wasn't a moment where a light switched on and I just said, yes, there's a God. I definitely believe in one. It was more like a journey, something that I wrestled with for a long period of time. And maybe it's something that you have had a lot of questions about for a long period of time. Maybe this question about is there a God is something that you have been thinking about for a very long time, and that's why you decided to jump in with us this week and look at this question. Now, people draw their conclusions about this from many different kinds of places. Maybe you grew up in a family that was very religious had a lot of spiritual beliefs. And so for you, believing in God just kind of seems like second nature. Maybe you didn't grow in a home like that. Maybe your life has been really tough. Maybe there are things in your life that lead you to believe that saying yes to this question, there is a God, is just too hard. Maybe you did believe in God and then you watched the Bears game a couple of weeks ago and things kind of went south for you. <laughs> or maybe you didn't believe in God and then like me, you married someone way too attractive to be interested in you and you're like, yes, there is a God. There's all kinds of reasons why we wrestle with this, but I think behind it all is this desire for us to know, is there something more? I remember I felt this for the first time when my wife was pregnant, and we actually just found out we're having our third baby this year, and so we're really excited about that, but the same feelings of awe and wonder always just come rushing straight back. And I remember a few weeks ago we were in the doctor's office and our baby was very, very small, but we could hear the heartbeat. And at the time, the baby was uh, smaller than my thumbnail, about the size of a sweet pea. And even then, we could hear this heartbeat beating. And I just kind of pause in that moment and think, wow, the complexity of that, the, the intricacy of that, the fact that there's this human life so small, it's almost too difficult to understand how all these things come together. And you just ask yourself, is there something behind all of this? Are we really just the result of random chemical processes and fortuitous events in the universe that have assembled everything the right way so that we can come about? Or is there something more? I don't know how we can possibly answer this question this morning completely, but what I want to do with you is I want to lead you through a psalm that someone called King David wrote. Some poetry that he wrote when he was probably reflecting on a question similar to this when he was sat down and asking himself about God. Who is he? Is he there? And in this psalm, I think that we find three pieces of evidence, not proofs, but evidence that God is real and that he is with us. We're gonna look at the evidence of nature, the evidence of morality, and the evidence of hope. And my challenge for you this morning is whether you are a deeply convicted religious believer, whether you are a curious seeker, or whether you are a definitive doubter. Let's all start from neutral ground this morning and ask ourselves afresh, is there a God? So if you wanna read with me, we are in Psalm 19. Uh, let me read this through and then we'll take a look. 
David writes, the heavens declare the glory of God and the sky above proclaims his handiwork. Day to day pours out speech and night to night reveals knowledge. There is no speech nor are there words whose voice is not heard. Their voice goes out through all the earth and their words to the end of the world. In them he has set a tent for the sun which comes out like a bridegroom leaving his chamber and like a strong man runs its course with joy. Its rising is from the end of the heavens and its circuit is to the end of them. And there is nothing hidden from its heat. The law of the Lord is perfect, reviving the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. The precepts of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. And the rules of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. More to be desired are they than gold, even much fine gold, sweeter also than honey and drippings of the honeycomb. Moreover, by them is your servant warned. In keeping them, there is great reward. Who can discern his errors? Declare me innocent from hidden faults. Keep back your servant also from presumptuous sins and let them not have dominion over me. Then I shall be blameless and innocent of great transgression. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. So the first thing I wanna look at this morning is the evidence of nature. Now, I am a big fan of Legos. I am totally unashamed to say that even at 31, if you bought me a Lego set, I would be your friend. Uh, it, I've actually discovered now, because I'm a huge nerd, that Lego actually creates custom Lego sets now for adults that couldn't grow out of it. So you get to tell them what you want them to make for you, and then you get to buy it for a, a ridiculous price. But uh, I've also tried to get my sons into it, right? Now my sons are getting older. I'm saying, hey, do you want to play with some Lego? And if they say no, I say, well, we'll just buy it anyway, and then Daddy can help you with that. <laughs> um, but I love doing Legos, right? Now if you went into a room, and you'd been coming over to my house, and you go into my son's room, and in the middle of the floor was like an Apache attack helicopter Lego set and you saw that helicopter sitting there, would it ever occur to you that perhaps by a chance of various forces and movements that that Lego has come together itself? Probably not. Because when you see a complex structure or a pattern, something of that nature that has a clear design to it, and you think, could this be the result of a gust of wind blowing in and clicking all these blocks together? Could these tiny little intricate pieces of it just find the exact right place? Maybe a mathematician out there would tell me that that's a, a slim possibility. But that's not our instinct. That's not what we go towards when we see that. And when David looks at creation and he thinks about God, that's not the conclusion that he draws either. When David's writing this and he sat with God, he says, the heavens declare the glory of God. The sky above proclaims his handiwork, day to day pours out speech, and night to night reveals knowledge. The Apostle Paul, a writer in the New Testament, says something very similar to that. He says, for his invisible attributes, namely his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world in the things that have been made. There's a great deal of positive evidence, I think, in the world around us, in nature, to suggest that there is a God. Because when we look around, we see these complex patterns, these structures, things going on in the universe around us that suggest this seems to be the work of a designer, of a creative mind. Even the idea that there is something as opposed to nothing suggests that there's been some kind of thought or creative intention behind it. Why would everything come together in the way that it has? Now, I totally realize that just saying that this morning does not definitively prove anything at all about God. There are many men far more intelligent than I that have tried to wrestle with this question and come to different conclusions. But I think one thing that we should at least acknowledge together this morning is that though sometimes this is kind of portrayed as a wrestling between intellectual ideas and, and scientific study and then faith, that really it's not quite as black and white as that. Faith and reason are not necessarily two things that are opposed. You see, most of us quite often will take the presupposition that, well, faith is something that you do or believe when you don't have evidence. And really, if we use our faculty of reason and our senses and we think about this as, as grown adults, 
then there's no way that something like faith could make sense. This is actually the question that someone called Richard Dawkins asked in a debate with a Christian. Richard Dawkins is a biologist and a very famous atheist. He wrote a book called The God Delusion. And in his debate, he was arguing with a man called John Lennox, a mathematician from England. And he said, faith is the only the kind of word you use when you don't have evidence. Faith is what you say when you have no, nothing else to support what you believe. And John Lennox replied, well, I don't think that's the case. Let me ask you, Richard, do you have faith in your wife? And Richard Dawkins says, yes. And then John Lennox asked him again, is there any evidence for your faith in your wife? And Richard Dawkins was forced to reply again, yes, there is. You see, the truth is faith and reason are not opposed. They are partners. In almost every belief that human beings can hold, we are using a partnership of reason and faith when we think things out. Tim, uh, Tim Keller, a pastor from New York, has talked about this quite a bit. And he suggests that even in the idea of atheism, there is a measure of faith being used. He said, if there is no God, then either original matter sprang from nothing, or original matter has always existed, or there is an infinite regress of causes without beginning. Each of these answers takes us out of the realm of science and the universe we know. They are nothing short of miracles. See, the truth is to hold a belief that there is no God at all, whilst perhaps reasonable, is also using just as much faith as a position that there is a God. One way or the other, we do not have empirical proof that there is a God in this universe. It's why we continue to wrestle with this question. So we shouldn't be setting up faith and reason as enemies. Now the other problem with doing it that way and setting them up against one another is there's a great many men in history who have been very reasonable men and have come to the conclusion that there is a God. To list just a few, Galileo, Isaac Newton, Cuvier, Kelvin, Mendel, Kepler, scientists throughout history whose work and ideas we are still building science on today. Now you might be led to say, well they lived a very long time ago and they didn't know what we know right now and so it's understandable that they might believe in a God, but not us. And the problem with saying something like that is if we take a character like Isaac Newton whose ideas about gravity in the universe are still forming the basis on which we do science today, then we start to look a little foolish. Because Isaac Newton did not make his discoveries by punching numbers into a computer and doing complex experiments with incredibly sophisticated equipment. Isaac Newton discovered things about our universe by simply looking at it and forming deductions, thinking about it carefully, investigating it carefully. He worked out things that we need computers to do on a piece of paper and in his head. So Isaac Newton was not a foolish man. It wasn't just that he was missing some kind of information that we now have. And the conclusion of David when he looks at the universe is similar to Isaac Newton. He looks and he sees the stars. He sees the display of the patterns and the organization around him and says, this has got to be God. There has got to be some kind of creative mind behind this incredible world that I see. And it's not just simply the fact that there is something as opposed to nothing, even the very way that everything in this universe seems in such a perfect balance suggests a creative mind behind it. There are so many precise balances that even allow the universe itself just to exist, never mind us. If gravity was just a few percentage points stronger, the entire universe would collapse in on itself in what's called a big crunch because the force at the center would be too strong. Everything would just fall in on itself. If something called dark energy, a force which helps maintain balance in the universe, was a few percentage points stronger, then the entire universe would expand unceasingly and no matter would be able to stick together. There would be no such thing as planets or stars because nothing could come together then we can just look at our own planet, planet Earth, which hangs in the middle of something called the Goldilocks Zone. The Goldilocks Zone is a name that scientists have given, given to a distance from a main sequence star in which a planet can have liquid water on the surface. Liquid water is incredibly important to life. If our planet was even a few steps forward closer to the sun, water on the surface would boil away. 
If we were a few steps further away from the sun, water on the surface of the planet would freeze like it does on Mars. There's so many things we could get into. The chemical composition of our atmosphere, the mass of our moon that controls the tides, which has an unbelievable effect of life on this planet. We could look at the fact that our planet has existed for potentially millions and billions of years, and not once has it been struck significantly enough for life to be wiped out. When at any given time there is countless numbers of astronomical bodies flying past us. We could look at cosmological constants like the speed of light, things that just all together form this perfect balance in which the universe can exist and we can exist. Now when we think about all those many complicated philosophical and scientific ideas, we can look at them and I think we can only really find two conclusions. Either someone has intentioned it to be that way or it is the result of sheer chance. Either by sheer luck, countless numbers of scientific things have come together in the perfect proportion to allow our planet to exist or someone has done it on purpose. Someone has set up a balance which allows us to live. Francis Collins, the director of the Human Genome Project, wasn't a Christian when he started doing his scientific work. But what he said was that the, we live on the knife edge of improbability. The unreasonable effectiveness of mathematics points to God's existence. There is no particular reason why all the events of the universe should follow such simple mathematical equations. I think when we consider the evidence of nature, we've got to come down to one more question. What requires more faith? What requires more faith to believe about the world in which we live? That all of these countless numbers of things, things that are far beyond you and I, have come together as a matter of chance, or that someone has intentioned them. But this is not the only evidence we have. We have the evidence of morality. Now, I'm not the best DIY guy at all. In fact, I despise doing DIY projects because I usually destroy a part of the house when I do it. Uh, but nevertheless, I want to make sure that I'm a good husband and I'm helping Junaid do those things. So uh, whenever we've got a project to do, hanging a shelf, anything like that, I will go ahead and YouTube it and figure out how to do it. it never works out well for me. And in particular, the time when it gets the worst for me is when I'm trying to hang something level, like a picture or a mirror or something like that. There's actually a mirror in our house. If you were to lift it off the wall, there's like six drill holes going down on each side. And we just hide those, right? Now, what's particularly embarrassing for me is whenever you are trying to get something level, there is a tool whose name is the name of your problem, right? You never feel more stupid than when the tool has got the name of your problem, like level, right? Why, why was I eyeballing that? And of course, the way level works is that it gives you a standard by which you can measure things, right? So if I'm trying to hang a mirror, if I'm trying to hang a shelf, I hold my level up and it tells me exactly at what kind of distance I need to hang it. It tells me, okay, I've got it, I've got it set, I've got it straight, I can put my holes in, I can put my screws in, I'm good. But without a level, and you're doing it the Andrew Griffiths way and you're eyeballing it, it might look very level to you, but you have no way of knowing whether it is or not. Without this tool, without this standard, I can't say for sure whether I have actually got something level or not. I need something against which I can measure it. And morality actually works in a very similar way. When we start talking about things that are right and wrong, in order to say that, we need some kind of standard to measure it against. How do we know what's right and wrong? David, when he continues this psalm writing, he comes to a point where he says, the law of the Lord is perfect, reviving the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. The precepts of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. Very rare do you hear someone talking about the law of God that way, talking about God's commands in a way that it says it, it causes him to rejoice, it revives him, it enlightens him. I think what David is saying is that when he considers the law that God has laid out, the commands that God has laid out about this world, that it, it provides for him a way for him to understand his life. It gives him a standard by which he can measure the decisions he makes. And I think another evidence for God's existence 
is the fact that there is such thing as objectively moral values. By that I mean there are things that are absolutely right, no matter which culture, time, or place in the world you come from. And there are things that are absolutely wrong. Now why does that evidence God? Why does that make me believe that there is a creator behind it? Because without God, I don't know what the standard is. I don't know by what I'm measuring things against to say that they are right or wrong. C.S. Lewis, before he believed in God, actually wrestled with this very same question. He said, my argument against God was that the universe seemed so cruel and unjust. But how would I got this idea of what is unjust? A man does not call a line crooked unless he has some idea of a straight line. What was I comparing this universe with when I called it unjust? There's many things that we would probably very quickly this morning agree are absolutely, objectively wrong. We all care about human rights, the dignity of the people that live around us. We care about preserving life. We care about caring for those who can't care for themselves. We care about loving our families, raising our kids. But have you ever considered why? Why do we value those things? Why are those things right and good? Why are the things that we howl against wrong? Why is it that when we see war and we see injustice, we shake our fist and a holy rage comes up within us and we say, that is wrong? Where are we getting that standard when we say things are right and wrong? Though we really rarely consider this because it's so philosophical, I think when we consider it, we need a better answer than it just is. You see, morality cannot be just a matter of taste. That's actually a very dangerous place to go, to simply say that something is wrong or right because I feel it to be so. Because when I see that, I just feel that it's wrong. And and we can definitely have moral feelings without God, but I don't think we can have a moral standard something that we can measure against. How do we agree on this? Is it majority consent? Is it whoever has the power or the money or what most people agree with? Is it personal experience? Things that have worked out for me are good, but things that have worked out for me are bad. Do we allow our culture to decide for ourselves what's right and wrong so that here in America, something might be right and wrong, but in a totally different place in the world, things can change and right and wrong can become different? Laws change, cultures change, countries change, people change. Terrible things can be done that are called moral, and in another generation, they they become called immoral. If we don't ground what we think right and wrong is in something outside of ourselves, outside of space and time and people, then we don't have something that we can stand on and say, this is absolutely wrong and this is absolutely right. That's why I think that the theist, someone who believes in God, actually has the most reasonable basis to say that something is right and wrong because there is a standard against which a believer is measuring their morality. For example, I believe that human beings have rights and dignity because they're created in the image of God. So no matter where you come from or what you've been through, to me, your life is incredibly valuable. I believe that the weak should be cared for and those amongst us that can't care for themselves should be cared for because God has commanded me to do that. He has said that that is right and good and just. But the materialist has no such basis to say those things. And in fact, if you are a materialist and you believe that nature is all that there is, then really what makes the most sense is to let the weak perish because they hold back the potential of the human race because survival of the fittest is the best way to improve ourselves. Some materialists actually acknowledge this problem. Bertrand Russell, an atheist, once said, I cannot live as though ethical values are simply a matter of taste, but I don't know the solution. Because if you don't believe there is a God, where do you draw your line? How do you decide what your life should look like? 
I've found in my life that the only way to have a true sense of justice and right and wrong is to have someone who exists outside of myself, someone who created this world with a purpose, who created me with a purpose, and has a standard by which I can evaluate right and wrong. Now at this point, we have talked through two pretty heavy, deeply philosophical ideas, and if I'm starting to lose you, I wouldn't blame you. Because I think that most often, talking about whether or not there's a God, it doesn't really come down to our questions about science and the origins of the universe. It doesn't come down to our questions about right and wrong. Most often the question of is there a God comes down to who that God really is. You might hear people say things like, well, I couldn't believe in a God that would do this. Or I couldn't possibly believe in a God that would allow this. Those are some of the questions that I've wrestled with in my journey. When I thought about, is there a God? I didn't come to my conclusion because someone said, well, there's no better scientific explanation, Andrew. And so I said, okay, I'm in. It was because there was questions in my life, experiences in my life that I needed to wrestle through. I needed to know what he is really like. What I really needed was the evidence of hope that David talks about. He says at the close of his psalm, let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. When David talks about God, he is not talking about some cosmic creator that's far off in the distance that can't be known. He's not talking about some moral judge that judges us coldly at the end of our lives, but someone who is deeply involved in the experience of his life. David calls him my rock, my redeemer. He talks about being in his sight, being seen by him. Ultimately, the Christian conviction about God, it isn't built on philosophy. It isn't built on some clever arguments. The deepest conviction that a Christian has about the existence of God is because God himself has made himself known because God has presented himself to us. Chances are, if you say to me, I don't believe in the God that could do this or is this way, I don't believe in that God either. And in fact, many of the concepts and popular ideas of God that exist in our culture are not the depiction of God in the Bible. So let me tell you this morning the God that I do believe in, the God that the Bible tells us about. I believe in the God who is revealed in space, time, and history. The God who, with his words, spoke the universe into existence. The God who, from the very beginning, crafted human beings to be in fellowship with him, to know him, to walk with him, to love him, and enjoy him. The God who created us in his own image so that every human life has dignity and worth from the womb to the classroom to the operating room to the boardroom. I believe in the God who called Abraham, who said to him and called him out of a foreign land, I am going to use you and through your family bless the ends of the earth. And I believe in the God who said to that same man's wife in the barrenness of your womb, I'm gonna bring forth new life and through whom all the nations of the earth will be blessed. I believe in the God of the Bible, who when he looked at his people suffering and heard their cries, was compelled to come to their rescue, to pull them out of slavery, to redeem them so that they could come and know him and worship him and enjoy him. I believe in the God who throughout the history of humanity has sought and searched and fought for human beings. I believe in the God who does not stand at a distance, but who enters into our world, about whom John in the New Testament wrote, he was in the world and the world was made through him, yet the world did not know him. He came to his own and his own people did not receive him, but to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen his glory, glory as of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. 
I believe in a God who has involved himself with the suffering of this world, who has taken on our form and walked through what we walk through and felt what we feel. I believe in the God who gave his son, his most treasured son for my sake and for your sake to redeem this broken world and to set right what has gone wrong. I believe in the God who raised that same son three days later from the grave and presented him to over 500 witnesses and gave them the good news that what was wrong has been made right and that all that come to him can know him. And finally, I believe in the God who loved me and called to me, even though I gave him no reason to do so, even though I am wrong among millions and I'm insignificant in the sight of someone of this power. And I believe in the God who does the same thing for you, who calls you and knows you, every hair on your head, every beat of your heart, every tear that you shed. We can argue backwards, forwards, sideways, every way that we could possibly imagine. Is there a God? But when it comes down to it, I don't think that we wrestle with this question because we want to know an explanation for the origin of the universe. I think we wrestle with this because we want to know, is there someone out there that values my life? Is there something beyond this which makes my life significant? I believe that there is. I believe that the strongest evidence I have as a Christian that God is real is not philosophy, is not science, but experience. That I have no other explanation for what I have experienced in my life and in the life of those around me than that there is a God who has called out to us, that has made himself real to us. As we finish what is a way too brief explanation of this question, my challenge to you and my edge to you is to pause and to think about the God of Christianity, the God that David talks about, the God who does not wait for you to understand him or accept him before he loves you and gives your, himself for you. In all the cultures, in all the religions, in all the places in the world, you will not find a concept of God like that, a God who does not ask you to find your way to him, but who makes his way to you. Would you pray with me as we close this morning? Lord, there are many things that can be said about you. There are many arguments that can be made. There is incredible evidence to suggest that you are there. But Lord, I thank you for the evidence that beyond your existence, you are a God who draws near. I thank you for the moments in my life where you have made yourself plain to me through my smallness and my misunderstanding. And Lord, I pray for my friends here this morning, those who are asking this question and reaching out, wondering, are you listening? God, I pray that you would make yourself plain to them. In Jesus' name, amen.